Hello everyone. Today we're looking at a topic that's just a little bit different, but I know that you will enjoy it. I call today's topic the two trains. This is the discussion of the two covenants and how they overlap and what happens during that overlap time period. What's a covenant? Covenant is a means by which God relates to his people. Really a contract would be another word for it quite happily. The first train we're going to look at represents the the old covenant that was given or at the time of the uh, in the wilderness wanderings just after the exodus out of Egypt and Moses administered that covenant. We uh, call it the old covenant or the Old Testament refers much to it. I'm going to use the word old covenant however here. There is a time where both the old and the new covenant operate at the same time. The old covenant comes, begins to come to an end, and the new covenant begins, starts, and then begins to come into its fullness. At that time, we'll see two tracks parallel. Two tracks parallel. Two trains, if you will, one on each track. This is a time that's not very well understood by Christians, and people often get this mixed up in what's going on here. The other thing we're get then going to note is that after the two trains stop, after they're stopped being two tracks, there's only one track, which is the new covenant that we're in today that goes on forever. What happens to the second, the earlier old covenant track? Why does it no longer exist? Well, it, the train on it comes to an abrupt end at a terrible train wreck, using the train metaphor again. The old covenant track had a fixed endpoint, and the endpoint was disaster. You had to get off that train um, before the disaster hit. Now, when you have a look at it and use this kind of language, you find this is not really too bad a way. It's actually a very good way to look at the theology of the New Testament and how it works. So. I'm going to flick to some other images here, a lot more images today than at other times, and we'll use an active mouse pointer. The train at the top refers to the Old Covenant period. I said that began about uh, 1400 BC and ended at AD 70, the fall of Jerusalem. The train below or the track below began with the events from the death and resurrection of Christ to Pentecost, a 50-day period, and continues on today. And it, it reached its fullness at the about the same time as the top train ended. Okay, so we're looking at two tracks, two trains. Now specifically, we're going to be looking at this period here today. Okay, so this was our first slide. This is the period we're going to look at. That period from the uh, coming of the work of Christ up until and actually the work of John the Baptist just a little bit before, up until AD 70. That's the timeline that's going to involve most of what we're talking about in this session. This is the session, the time during which the New Testament was written. And that's really important to get your head around this. This time period from AD 30 to AD 70 was the last days spoken of by the Old Testament prophets, Jesus, and the New Testament writers. All New Testament books, writ uh, all New Testament books were written in this time period. The word were is missing there. Even the book of Revelation. Coming up, we're actually going to do videos. I'm going to continue this topic range where we'll look at the dating of the book of Revelation. We'll look at events that had to happen then and so on. And that will really help you to get a good picture of what's going on. Now, I want to just note the ministry of two extremely important people. There's actually a, a, this really John and the other apostles need to be here as well. But specifically, we talk a lot about the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we note that he began to minister about 35, the year 35 AD. And his life ended somewhere around 64 AD. He was martyred. And then Peter's ministry began a little bit before Paul's. There are some questions about when these exactly began and when they ended. Now, uh, I'm we could put the ministry of John there and James and so on as well. But typically we quote these two, I would, uh, well certainly Paul more, and in this related discussion, Peter, I don't think we'll, oh yeah, Peter gets a quote today too, yes. Now, I am working off these dates for the crucifixion 
and um, for the crucifixion of Christ and the beginning of his ministry. I'm working off the year 27 as, as the time when the Lord was baptized and the year 30 when he was crucified. Now, there are people who uh, dispute that. I think it's about a 50-50 school on that. And really, it's not that important here, but this is why you see me starting Peter's ministry in the year 30 uh, as the time when um, Pentecost took place and the Spirit was poured out and Peter began to minister. Now, Peter did travel with the Lord Jesus Christ before then, but um, we're talking about his ministry as an apostle. It's a lot to cover to get our heads around all of this, isn't it? Now, Paul stated clearly what he preached and why he preached it. So we're going to have a look at our first scripture of the day, which is Acts chapter 26, 22. To this day, I have, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. So Paul's ministry, he proclaimed nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. Many people don't know that passage, but that's a very, very substantial statement when you read the work of Paul. What did Paul write? Well, he wrote uh, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Thessalonians, did I say Colossians as well, and uh, pastoral epistles to Timothy and Titus. Philemon I might have missed as well. I should just pop them all up there and say, here are Paul's writings. And of course, Paul is quoted in the book of Acts uh, as well and quoted even by Peter. Now, um, Peter also talked about how important the prophetic message was in his seminal sermon in Acts chapter 3, Peter says this. I'm just quoting three verses, Acts 3.18. But what God foretold by the mouth of the, of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Later on, he says, whom heaven and earth must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. In verse 24, and all the prophets who had spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. So Peter spoke about uh, and referred to and referenced the prophets all the time as well. What was he talking about these days? Well, Peter proclaimed at the sermon at Pentecost that they were in the last days. The prophets all talked about the last days. There's a little nugget I'm going to share with you as we, as we continue this discussion, but not just yet. Now let's go to a broader timeline here for a moment. And we're going to look at the Old Covenant timeline. So it began about 1500 BC. There, again, there's abouts on this, but I'm, don't beat me on the head if your date is 1450 or whatever I said about. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53 talked about the Lord Jesus Christ coming, bearing our sins in his body and um, so on in a long and beautiful chapter. I hope you've read Isaiah chapter 53 and studied it, but it talks about that. Isaiah 53 was largely fulfilled at the events of the cross. What happened at the cross? The Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins at the cross. So this was largely fulfilled here. And, and so you notice that this was a promise made to Old Covenant Israel that was fulfilled in Christ. Here's another promise that was made to Old Covenant Israel. The prophet Joel said in the last days, God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. Hmm. When was this prophecy fulfilled? Well, Peter makes the point in the book of Acts that this is what was fulfilled. This is what was promised or prophesied by Joel. The events you're seeing when the Spirit of God came and people spoke in tongues and it was a, a mighty manifestation, Peter said, this is that which was prophesied by Joel the prophet, saying in the last days. Now, there's no other event that is fulfilled by that. Somebody said, well, whatever happened to 1967 or some movement or whatever happened, that must be the fulfillment, the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy about the last days. No, what part of this is that? that was prophesied by Joel, do you not understand? 
The events that took place at Pentecost were the beginning or marked the last days. Well, that's really interesting. Now, there's another one here that I have just as an example here. In the book of Amos, we read about the tabernacle of David. In the book of Acts, and that's Amos 9, in Acts chapter 15, we read that the tabernacle of David was being built in this transitional period. It was also a promise to Old Covenant Israel. Now, to be fair, ladies and gentlemen, if I was to take this event here, uh, this time period, and I was to go and grab all of the prophecies from 1500 BC and before and show where they're fulfilled in this time window, you couldn't read the slide. You just would have to expand it and expand it and expand it. Hundreds, literally, well, literally hundreds, and probably more when you talk about the subtleties and the nuances that, that come from the Old Testament that we see fulfilled in this period of time. In fact, Jesus even said and taught that all prophecy would be fulfilled in this time window. In this time window. And this line would, would be just so full, you wouldn't make any sense of it. I would just clutter the screen. So I've taken three examples. Even the prophecy from Isaiah that says that the wolf will lie down with the lamb. Now, the Bible never says the lion will lie down with the lamb, by the way. Some artists decided that's a good thing to do, but the Bible never says it. But it talks about the wolf and the lamb living together. Paul himself quotes that passage as a fulfillment of his ministry in this time window. I hope I'm not losing too many of you here, but Paul himself, Paul quoted the passage in Isaiah that talks about the wolf lying down with the lamb as a fulfillment of Paul's actual work, of being fulfilled in Paul's actual work. And that's really amazing when you think about it. It's a lot to ponder here. Now, come back to our two trains for a moment. The train of the Old Covenant is heading to a train wreck, but people are happily on it. So from the time of the, uh, of the death and the resurrection of Christ, people are happily on this train, and they're just going along. Coming up along parallel to that train and running side by side with it now is the New Covenant train. And there are people on the new covenant train calling out to people on the old covenant train, you've got to come over here. You need to come to Christ and be born again. You need to lay aside those things on that one, and you need to come to Christ. You need to hop onto this train. So you can hear that. Now, when you read the New Testament now, you get a sense of, yes, I'm beginning to hear the message of Christ calling me onto this train. So one of the things that's very evident when you read the New Testament is during this time window that we're very interested in, Old Covenant believers and Gentiles start coming to Christ. And they start coming to Christ in huge numbers. So what do I mean by Old Covenant believers? Well, they would have been um, Hebrew believers, Jews, who were involved with the temple system. Uh, you have, uh, you've got Nicodemus later on who comes. You've got many who come from the Jewish kingdom you, uh, who've come to Christ, and they come to faith in Christ. And then, of course, you have people who have no Jewish background at all, uh, in, in various cities all over the, the known world at the time, people from Corinth, uh, Ephesus, Colossae, and so on, who start uh, pouring into what we call the church. And other good name, well, no, I don't want to do that. We'll just, I was going to use just another name. I don't want to confuse you. So this starts happening at a very, very high rate all the way through the New Testament. You start seeing people turning from the Old Covenant and and hopping on to this new covenant train. Now, something else begins to take place at this time. There were people on the new, well, they might have been on the new covenant train, but they tried to convince believers who were now coming to Christ that they still had to adhere to the law. We call those people Judaizers. And they were saying you had to be, the men had to be circumcised and you had to keep the Sabbath and you had to uh, stay with the appropriate um, Old Covenant uh, eating styles and feasts and so on. And they were hindering people coming into the, hopping on to the New Covenant train, if you will. 
The book that is most dedicated to dealing with this is the book of Galatians. Paul writes virtually the entire book of Galatians is a wonderful legal argument that talks about the fact that the old covenant is ending and the new covenant has started and that the old covenant is not dependent, that the, the relationship with Christ that we have is not dependent on circumcision or any of those other factors from the old covenant law. So this sense of Judaizers is really common in the New Testament. And if you read the New Testament with your kind of ears open and aware of this, you start getting this sense and it, this starts to answer a lot of questions. Really, the, uh, the two-train um, story that I tell has a lot to do with this relationship with understanding the Judaizers in the New Testament. But it goes a little bit farther than that. During this time period, that is from basically from the time of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out, up until just before the fall of Jerusalem, there was an other event happening and other very serious event happening all through the New Testament. There was a severe persecution of Christians. And you, noted the, you note the arrow, the arrow that I've put here uh, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. So Old Covenant authorities, you know, the Pharisees and those behind them, were driving persecution of Christians. It, it, just think about this whole two-train scenario. I'm comfortable on my train, the Old Covenant train. I don't believe your warning that the Old Covenant, the train that I'm on, is going to, is going to come into a, a terrible disaster and be destroyed. I don't believe it. I'm comfortable here. All of these people who are hopping off my train and hopping onto the train of Christ, the New Covenant train, putting faith in Christ, who we, we nailed to a cross and called a common criminal, all of these people are in, uh, are in rebellion, they're in sin, they're doing something wicked, we're going to do what we can to persecute them and to destroy them. And that persecution occurred all over the, the then world, if you will. It occurred in, particularly, it was very, very strong in the Thessalo against the Thessalon hard to say, the Thessalonian Christians. We'll get a reference to that later on. It happened in virtually all of the cities um, that the scripture is are, were written out to uh, Rome, Galatia, etc., etc., and particularly strong in Jerusalem. So the Christians were being persecuted; many were being martyred, and this was a. This is also all the way through the New Testament. You read the New Testament, particularly the Book of Acts, you start seeing this, and you need to keep your eyes and ears kind of open to it it makes the New Testament make a lot more sense, okay? So these three components of the New Testament are critical for people just beginning to understand it. Old Covenant believers and Gentiles who are coming to Christ in this period of time, they, the, uh, during this time also there is a movement of people we call Judaizers demanding that these Old Covenant believers stay with the law. And at the same time, there was severe persecution of Christians. So there's a lot going on in this time. Of course, also New Testament doctrine was being formed and was being established at the time as well. And that's important. So, and there's more. By the way, I haven't begun. Well, I have begun, but I haven't. Uh, I can't address all of that in this time window. I think, however, there will be a series of possibly monthly videos where we follow this on and develop it a lot more fully. Now, there is some scripture about this persecution that took place, and Paul particularly writes to the church at Thessalonica, the Thessalonian church. You can read Paul's two letters to the, Thess to the Thessalonians. That's tough to say, especially on video where you don't want to sort of breathe and look around at your audience and flip some papers and so on. On video, man, you start and you just got to stay with the package the whole time. Then sometimes I watch my videos and I go, oh, dear Lord, do I recut it or do I not? Anyways, let's look at Paul's comments in 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 8. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. 
when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Paul talking about the fact that the Thessalonians were being heavily persecuted and that God would afflict the persecutors when he's revealed in flaming fire. And we're going to have a look at that only. I'm just going to touch it today, but you'll understand this or get a picture of this so I can develop it in future videos. Remember, we're also doing the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the Trinity. So we, we don't want to we don't want to sort of change direction, though I might do a few of these on the side. I'm tempted. And so, but Paul says God will avenge the suffering that's been brought against the Thessalonians at some time. Well, the Thessalonians are all gone. They've died years ago. So when did God or when will God or whatever avenge them? If he does it today, that's a bit silly. No, it had to be in a time when they were suffering and could be relieved from the suffering. Now let's go on a little bit farther on. Paul identifies the source of their trouble. And this is also interesting. For this reason, this is 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 16. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, for forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me read verse 15 again and on. Who killed, talking about the Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Wow. Okay, so Paul, again, is talking about the persecution that was coming on, that had been coming on the church at the time on the new covenant believers. And notice he said Judeans persecuted even him forbidding the discussion of the gospel to the Gentiles. Why was this the case? Because Gentiles were coming into the kingdom of God. They were coming to Christ at a huge rate. So this persecution was extremely real, very, very evident in the life of the apostle Paul and all of this time. And remember that Paul's ministry and Peter's ministry both occurred in this time window from the events after Pentecost up until AD 70 when the Apostle Paul was, in fact, both Paul and Peter were martyred. They were killed for their faith. Okay, so let's get these two trains. We have two trains running. One begins about 1500 years BC. It's the only way that you come to God is to be part of the covenant, part of this relationship. You need to be on this train. And as it begins to move through time, it gets to the place where uh, promises made about uh, uh, points on the journey on the, of this train begin to be fulfilled at a very high rate. There are some fulfilled prior to this, of course, but they start to be fulfilled at a high rate with the coming of John the Baptist, with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, with his death, with his resurrection, with his ascension into heaven, and with the pouring out of the Spirit begin to be filled. At this point, people start coming to Christ. Well, they were coming to him in his earthly ministry. So, uh, slightly different discussion, which we can bring up at a later time. But we're talking about the new covenant train having begun. They start coming in to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and they, they, from all directions, Gentiles come in, that is people who'd never had the Old Testament before from all over the known world. And also, of course, many people on the old covenant train are being, are being pulled across onto the new covenant train. 
authorities on the old covenant train start an, an active persecution, start to uh, say, don't hop onto that train. Those people are unbelievers, etc., etc., etc. So you have this tension. There's a body of people that rise up that say, yeah, but if you do hop onto that train, you've got to keep the old covenant laws uh, and so on. So it becomes a real challenge. Paul says uh, during this time of persecution, the other apostles write about it too, that those who are persecuting are going to come to an extremely bad time. Judgment is coming. Now remember that I said that the two trains uh, would work in parallel for a while, but the one train was heading for a train wreck. Now the thing about this is the Lord Jesus Christ warned of the train wreck. He warned of the end of the Old Covenant train. All the apostles warned of the end of the Old Covenant train. When the law was given 1400, 1500 years BC, Moses warned of the time of the end, the time when this train is going to hit the station, or going to have a train wreck, and it will be a disaster. That's the last days. Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the easiest things to do in Scripture is to learn that we are not in the last days today. No, the last days were fulfilled at the train wreck of the end of the Old Covenant, just on time, exactly as Jesus and the apostles said. That's the time when the Lord came in judgment. The Old Testament called that coming in the clouds. That was the day of the Lord. There had been days of the Lord in the past. And that was the, the great day of the Lord took place at this event, this train wreck. Well, what was this train wreck? Come on, Al, you've got to do better than that. You just talked about a train wreck. The train wreck that we're talking about is the fall of Jerusalem in the year 70, AD 70. Jerusalem fell at the hands of the Romans when God came and brought judgment just as he said that he would. It's very interesting. Jesus, talking about the fall of Jerusalem, said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, he said to his people, flee, get out of the city. Its end has come. Its judgment has come. And in fact, ladies and gentlemen, that's precisely what happened. For a short time, Jerusalem was surrounded by armies. Then the armies went away. Then believers in Jerusalem and in the rest in, in that area ran and they escaped because they knew the train wreck was coming. Okay, so there we go. Hey, we managed to do this in our 30-minute time window. I can't believe it. I thought this is going to take me an hour for sure. Certainly, we're going to hop into more detail. Today, we have looked at the two trains. We've looked at the train of Moses, or the Old Covenant train that began about uh, 1400, 1500 years BC, and the train of the New Covenant that began around uh, 30 and the two trains that ran in parallel today, the fact that the fact is there's only one train, it's the New Covenant train. How do I get on the New Covenant train? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Come unto me, all you who are wearied, who are burdened, and I will give you rest. That New Covenant train is still running. It's still going, it's never stopping, it's gathering members. You're on this train, you have eternal life. My name is Al Persson. You can contact me at pastor at mascot.church or you can leave comments at the video if they are turned on. We've been looking at the two trains. God bless you. We'll talk later.